And what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually ask the guests of honor to come up, and I'm going to call you one up by uh, one at a time, and have you uh, sit up here in our panel so that we can all uh, start asking questions. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Kevin Kohler to come up, please. Uh, yeah. And really, truly, uh, on behalf of the KCA, NYU, Wild Cornell, and all the organizations that are here, we're very thankful uh, for you to actually, you know, volunteer and, and and agree to come up and speak in front of everyone. I know it's very nerve-wracking to do so. You can also ask uh, Eric Johnson. Uh, and if, and if the spouses or, or family members want to sit in the front row, just in case we have questions for you, uh, feel free to, to go ahead and do that. Uh, Whitey? Whitey, sorry. Whitey? Miss Holly? Uh, I'm going to ask Dan Rezalesco. And also uh, Ellen and Lee Meyer to come up. So I can talk about two uh, of the panelists that were actually three of the panelists that are up here uh, today. I'll um, just going to briefly introduce them, and and then we can go ahead and start asking questions. Everyone else can can talk about their stories as well. So I'm going to start off with uh, uh, Herb Roth. Uh, he's actually in the audience, but his uh, his daughter Ellen and uh, son-in-law Lee are up here. Uh, Dr. Roth is a, a, a retired internist who I met in 2013. So um, being an excellent internist, uh, as, as he, he was and still is, uh, he's retired now, he self-palpated. He felt his own tumor in his abdomen. And uh, this, led up, this led to um, getting ultrasounds and CAT scans and, and eventually biopsies of a kidney tumor that was not uh, resectable, so the unable, the surgeons were unable to remove this. Um, he was found to have a clear cell kidney cancer. And I, when I met him, I started him on Votrin and Pazopinib in May of 2013. And he, he's been on a low dose of this medication ever since uh, with a stable disease. And his... Uh, his uh, daughter and son-in-law are here, and we'll talk about uh, him today. Uh, the other person I can talk a little bit about is uh, uh, Dan. He's right there. So he um, uh, initially presented in 2010 with blood in the urine. Uh, at the time, he had a, a you know a nephrectomy, meaning they took the kidney out. He did present at the time with small little lung nodules and lymph nodes that were suspicious for. Uh, metastatic disease. And when I met him in uh, January of 2011, I talked to him about clinical trials and and uh, he was very interested and enrolled in uh, clinical trials. He's been on multiple clinical trials and is currently on his seventh, correct, seventh uh, drug. He's been on Votrans uh, uh, as well. Uh, now since, I have to, since May of 2012, he's been on Votrans with uh, stable disease. And um, what I'm going to do is ask the other uh, uh, speakers to go ahead and just introduce yourself and, and talk about your, your uh, how you were diagnosed uh, uh, with kidney cancer. Just the, the, the initial presentation diagnosis. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hi, uh, my name is Kevin Kohler. Um, I was diagnosed in 2008 um, with uh, blood in the urine and pain in my abdomen. Uh, went to the hospital um, and found that I had a tumor on my left kidney. Um, I want to sympathize with Sarah. Um, I also had a full open removal and can no longer wear my bikinis either. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, went to uh, interview a few oncologists after I had my kidney removed. And currently a, a patient of Dr. Alters. Um, I. I felt with Dr. Alter, uh, as he has already explained, he, he really takes the patient uh, first and treats the disease after that, um, which a couple of oncologists I met didn't leave me with that same impression. And he impressed me a lot, and that's why I chose him as my oncologist. Um, we watched it for a while, and then in 
2009, we saw uh, an opportunity. Uh, it was a short period that we watched. And then in 2009, early in 2009, we started um, IL-2. <coughs> I went with, uh, I believe it was three, cycle, three cycles, six weeks in the hospital from January 2009 till June of 2009. And um, it did help. Um, it reduced, it didn't give me complete cure but it did reduce uh, many of my tumors down to a more manageable size. Um, and from that point, we really watched it for growth and what it was going to do. It gave us uh, a period of time where we could not do anything and just watch to see what it was going to respond with. As we all heard, the IL-2 was hazing your system for a period of time, so it was still working, even though I wasn't going through the treatments anymore. And I do also agree with him as far as going through the IL-2. It really <coughs> equated more to a small California earthquake as opposed to flu-like symptoms. <laughs> if, if it was a flu, if that was flu, I don't want flu ever again in my life. Uh, a California earthquake, yeah, I could see that. Um, so it gave us a period of time to watch it. And um, I, I'm not exactly sure when we went on to Sutton. We tried Sutton first. And Sutton uh, brought its own bag of, of uh, gifts, let's say. Uh, it worked for a period of time. Um, and then uh, we discovered a tumor in my left uh, greater trochanter, um, which we had to address. So we got off the Sutton, took care of the tumor on the greater trochanter, um, which took a while to recover from. And then in uh, September of 2013, uh, Dr. Alter and Shauna, my, my nurse, uh, we decided to go on to a clinical trial um, using Delantracept and Enlita as the, uh, the drug of choice. And I've been on that since September of 2013. Uh, I don't know how many shots I've gotten now. 22. 22. Um, and thank God it's been working. Uh, it's keeping the tumors in check. Sometimes you see a little growth as we've been explaining, a little growth is, uh, is good. I mean, it's, it's, it's not good, but as Dr. Rose said, the patient always wants to see no growth or shrinkage. And obviously, when I hear a little growth, I say, you know, it's like, that's not good. But um, it's under control. Um, I'm able to function. I go to work, um, do whatever I need to do. I take care of my 93-year-old mother, who's broken her hip and her, her back in two places. So it's a full plate, but um, uh, going through the regimen every three weeks for blood tests, every six weeks for scans uh, is a little bit more on my plate, but um, as long as it's working, it's working. So uh, that's where we stand right now. Dr. Johnson. Okay. <clears throat> so I must be the lucky wimp in the audience here. Um, on the scale of things, I've heard uh, well, a couple of things, first of all. So I happen to happen to be a person who has the cancer, but my wife and I are the patient. Right? It's, it's been sort of a team thing since the very beginning that this came up. And another thing that I heard this morning, this being the first of the things that I've gone through like this, is that you never really have a direct path to finding out. It turns out we're both dedicated blood donors, or at least we were. And I got to this point in about 2009 where I kept getting rejected below hemoglobin. And this ticked me off. So I started plotting from those little blue sheets they give you when you go and try and get your many physicals, what the hemoglobin was doing. And from 2008 to 2010, it was dropping dramatically. And so I said, this is no good. I went to my GP. My GP was, OK, here, take some iron. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. You know, I'm 50 years old, and I got to this point, and that was OK. What is the problem here that this is, ah, you should go see Stanley Ostro. So um, he's, he's been our stalwart companion through this whole thing. Um, and it turns out, um, it took a while to figure this out. By the time I went to Dr. Ostrom, I think it was April or May of 2010, uh, sooner or later went through a series of things where they did an ultrasound. That didn't look good. They did a CT scan. It was obvious there was something not good. And so my right kidney was more or less completely blown out. No blood in the ear. No, none of the other kinds of clinical presentations that people normally would see. It was just this sort of chance discovery that the hemoglobin had gone back, and it was anemic, and I felt lousy. So that's fine. Uh, November 2010, they take out the kidney. 
um, I was just looking it up. I can't remember these things. It was uh, stage three, term and grade two, if that means something to anybody. And um, they thought that the margins, you know, the surgeon thought that it was great, that he got everything, he had to go right up to the vein in order to take it out, but he thought it was great, and then they looked at it and it turned out it had <coughs> cancer at the margin. So they put me on Sutent for uh, a little under two years, and uh, in the monitoring things that they were doing, something showed up in the left for highlight. And so it's kind of weird, it's not a place you can easily get to, but again, they got clever and they said, oh, well, we can, we can do a bronchoscopy and go in and check it. And sure enough, it was clear cell renal cancer. They come back. <coughs> so then um, Stanley says, oh, I have a friend, uh, Jan Dutcher. Why don't you go see her? So we wound up doing um, interleukin. I did just one, one week, and a week off, and then another week. That's all that I've done. And it knocked it down uh, dramatically. Um, and so I get monitored, and it keeps watching and it may be creeping back a little bit. At one point we looked at actually having that surgically removed. It's not a nice place to do it. Mm -hmm. And we wound up leaving it there thinking that okay, we nicknamed it P. This is the canary in the coal mine. You can watch it and you can see what's happening. And it doesn't seem to do anything really bad. The net bad effect that I've had so far from all of this stuff um, is that the thyroid is shut down so I have to do low thyroxine. But otherwise, you know, I'm the luckiest guy in the place it sounds like. Dan, I briefly introduced you, but you want to talk a little bit about how, how you found out about your cancer. Yes, it's, uh, so once again, I feel, first of all, I have to apologize for my Romanian English. Uh, I'll try to make it the, <coughs> the best as I could. I want to thank Dr. Marina, my wife, and the rest of the family. God bless her, because even though she tortured me enough, she still owes me a lot of money from all the pictures that she took. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, and also, I'm very glad that I, I'm not the only patient that I'm over here. When she called me a few days ago, I said, gee, if she calls me, that means that I'm the only guy alive out of her patients. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks God, it's not the case, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, I don't want to get through all the details. Most of it is like a common denomination. This is like denominator. It's like all of us. Uh, what, what hurts is that I also work uh, not as, as much as I used to. I work as a medical interpreter, and from this perspective, it's pretty interesting. Of course, I don't want to get all that stuff, and I don't want to make it too long. Like, it changed everything. The vision of life, the approaches, your family, the, 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 the scary part that you're not going to be able to, to provide with the rest of the family and so on. Uh, as a medical interpreter, it's even worse. Uh, I always like to do this job because I care for people. It's not about the money. Now, as I said, it's a different approach, and I'm going to talk just one minute about it because even as it's not great and I'm not allowed to do it, uh, like technically as my job talking about, I'm trying to encourage the patients, and even that I'm a pretty shy person and I don't want to give myself as an example, as a living example, I always try to encourage them and show the way. I, I, I still deal with this uh, goddamn disease after four years. It's not a happiness, and, and uh, I don't want to give them like false hopes, but at least I can tell them that here I am. I, I, lost, uh, uh, I lost some hair, I lost uh, some, uh, some pounds, uh, which was great, actually. <laughs> I put them back, unfortunately. But uh, after a few unfortunate uh, trials, unfortunate for me, because it was like serious side effects. That, that diarrhea that was mentioned earlier is terrible, and you really don't know what to do. No matter what you go for golfing, and you go for interpreting. I did a few times for you, you don't remember me. It was great experience. It was very nice. I even for Dr. Morin, I had to interpret a few times. And uh, you, you, you gotta you gotta stuff yourself with the uh, uh, what is it anymore? Yeah, I, I don't know the medical name because it's pretty embarrassing in the middle of it to to have yourself excused and go to the bathroom. Now uh, I'm pretty stable, as you can see. I can function. I walk. I, uh, I I I can enjoy the company of my wife and my two daughters. Uh, God bless them. God bless you all here. The Vortriad works. Uh, uh, Practically, it's like I don't even know. I guess for me, it's even easier that, that all my friends, <coughs> two of my friends, having to deal with the, with the, 
uh, with diabetes. Because I, I, I don't feel it. I, 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 I'm actually, it was a lot of side effects. I had to take a lot of medication. Gradually, I, I, I took them off, of course. Uh, my, my, my sweet doctor took care of it. It wasn't me that, that uh, just stopped them. Uh, because uh, I worked in the airlines and I was in pretty good shape. So I was pretty hit by this disease because all of a sudden it was the thyroid, <coughs> it was the cholesterol, it was the high blood pressure, things that I never had to, to, to care and to deal with before. Be, being in, working in the airlines is a pretty strict mm -hmm. annual checkup. You, 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 don't, you don't pass that one, you <coughs> practically, you, 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 you're not allowed to perform, to do your job. So I, I think that I was in a pretty good shape and all of a sudden it was a 100 degrees opposite uh, uh, approach of all this. So that's why, again, I'm sorry if I talk for too long, uh, again, I want to thank my doctor. Rotary and Works, uh, bless you all over here because with all, all the knowledge in the world and everything else, you, you contribute to us to be still alive and talk all kinds of nonsense at this microphone. Uh, thanks again for calling me today. And uh, God bless you all, thanks again. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm humbled to be here. I'm a little embarrassed, a little nervous. Um, and I'm, I'm very emotional, so I'll try to keep that in check. Um, it started out where I had a cough for almost a year, and slowly but surely I couldn't keep food down. And a friend of mine, who's also my doctor, told me to get to the, the emergency room, otherwise I'd have to wait a month or whatever to go to the doctor and I'd get diagnosed or whatever this was. Um, I was. It was Christmas Day, I was at my sister's house, and I left because I didn't feel well, and I found myself watching television all alone in my apartment, so I knew something was wrong. So we went to the emergency room, um, got a CAT scan, the next day the doctor comes in, you got a tumor, it's this big, we're gonna take it out, blah, blah, blah. So to make a long story short, I, um, they had to cut me like a fish, they cut me, I had a scar like this. Um, they took the, the kidney out, complete nephrectomy, um, renal cell, and spleen. Thought they got it all, thought it was a miracle because it was so advanced. Uh, three months later, what I thought might be the worst day of my life, um, but it got worse. Uh, they said that it spread to my lungs. Um, the other thing was that uh, I had uh, extension to my belly, which still hasn't gone down. I don't understand that. Um, that was a joke. <laughs> so uh, that was my big joke. I was waiting for it. <laughs> so um, my brother got online. This is 15 years ago. So I'm cancer-free 14 years or so. Um, my brother went online and found someone else who had kidney cancer because it wasn't a lot known. And he knew of Dr. Dutcher, the guy was in California. And we had gone to a few other places. One very notable hospital kind of gave me a time limit and said they were going to make me comfortable. So we met Dr. Dutcher, and uh, she gave us some options, and uh, we went with her, and the rest is history. Um, it had spread to my lungs and it was like uh, pretty advanced, uh, the nodules, there were many nodules. So I did interleukin two. I tried, I think the first week was maybe three days and I couldn't take the high dose. So I went home, came back a week later, we did the low dose and I really got a lot of reaction from that also. And uh, her staff, they were fantastic. And I took a week off, came back. And, and the thing about it was, like they say, it's a, you, a really bad flu. I really reacted terribly to it. My blood pressure would go down. I blacked out a few times. I was on the toilet one time. I just fell down. And I had four or five nurses getting me up. Um, I don't want to get too graphic, but I was throwing up in bed and puking and pooping at the same time. It was really bad. Um, but come Friday, when I was done with it, I couldn't wait to get out of there Saturday morning. I, run home and I'd be coaching Little League Baseball in the sun with an umbrella. And uh, that was my uh, my saving grace. But then I did another week, so that was like two and a half weeks of the cycle. And then uh, I kept taking the CAT scans and they were going down, 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 cured. So that's my story. 
So then, it's about three, two years later after I'm uh, cancer free, I'm a horse ride. And uh, I had a bad horse and we were working with him on the ground and I got kicked in the jaw. And uh, I was in an induced coma for 11 days. Uh, this is all reconstructive surgery. So I'm here for a reason. So whatever that is, maybe it's here to talk to you. So I love you, Dr. Fletcher. <laughs> Helen and me. Hi. As Dr. Molina said, my father is here on behalf of my dad, who's here. Um, my dad's a retired physician, so uh, <coughs> you can imagine what that brings to the process. Um, and he was about a year, two years ago, down in Florida. He and my mom moved down there, and he took a tumble. And while he was, he was 80 at the time, and while he was on the floor, because he has bad hips from other stuff. And trying to get to the phone, he decided to examine himself to see if he broke any ribs. That was where his head was. And he felt a mass. And it was large enough at that point that he thought it was his liver. So he did what any doctor probably would do. He didn't tell anybody. <laughs> and a few months or so later, he's laughing, um, they were planning on moving up to New York anyway because we wanted to be closer to them. And he comes up, and I had scheduled uh, an appointment with our internist just for a physical, just so we could have a baseline. And as I'm driving him to the internist, uh, he says to me, there's something I need to tell you. Uh, when I fell, which I didn't tell you, um, I felt a mass in my abdomen, and I think it's my liver. And if it's my liver, I just want you to know I've had a good life and we're not doing anything about it. I'm driving. And <laughs> I don't even have a chance to tip the doctor off who we're friendly with. So I send him into the doctor and I come with him to sit there and the doctor does a wonderful job there. They had never met before and they were hugging and kissing by the end of the appointment. And he says to my father, Herb, what's on your mind? And he shared with him, I think I have a mass, and I think it's my liver. And he repeats that. He says, well, we don't know it's your liver. Let's find it together, and we will come up with a course of action. He comes out of the exam room. He does have a mass. We don't know it's his liver. It could be. Uh, let's send him for some tests. So send him for a sonogram. We go up. He says, good news. Uh, it's not in the liver. He said, the other news, it's in your kidney. So let's take this one step at a time. And he picked up the phone, and he called Memorial, and we went over there, and we first saw a surgeon, and we all agreed he was not a candidate for a surgery. And he had had, he had, had a CAT scan, and we saw it had metastasized, not majorly, a couple of nodules in the lungs, a little bit of encroachment on the liver, but pretty much you know, enough that he was not a candidate for surgery. And then, um, if luck would have it, um, we were referred to that angel standing over there, Dr. Molina. And it's been, it'll be two years in May. He went on Votrian, it's a low dose, and everything has been stable. We go for CAT scans every 12 to 16 weeks. My husband's here because it's the three of us are the team. Uh, we moved my parents to about a couple of miles from us. They live in a senior, uh, um, at home, a senior living uh, apartment, and uh, we, you know, we take him to all his appointments. We have a very dear friend. We both work in the city and live outside in Westchester. When I spoke to Dr. Molina, I said if I if I spoke to families, I would say we're we're not the type of people who like to ask for help. We have a very very dear friend who picks my dad up and looks forward to it to pick him up at his apartment up in Westchester, drives him down to the hospital. We come from our offices and meet him there to every single appointment. And my father looks forward to them because he looks forward to his visits with Dr. Molina. And she is, she's such an angel that she, you know, it's not clinical. It's, although obviously there's a clinical component, but she comes into the room and she chats and they talk, he tells stories, they talk about medical things, they, uh, we are not physicians. Uh, and, you know, half of the things we don't know what they're talking about. And they, uh, he really enjoys those visits. So when Dr. Molina called us and she said, you know, do you think you'd like to come? And we asked my dad, he said, well, I won't speak, but if Dr. Molina wants us to do something, we're going to come and do it. And, you know, he, upon his diagnosis, he thought, you know, that's it. You know, I'm done. I had a nice life. It's over. And, you know, the first year, all of the holidays, 
Um, we said, okay, we're gonna have, the whole family has to be together for every holiday. We're now on round two of the holidays. Um, and you know, we're, he's stable and uh, it's, all, it's all good. So thank you. <laughs> I'd like to open it up to questions that the audience may have. I would like to say that I've never had any um, any signs of the kidney cancer. I didn't have any urine, uh, blood in my urine. I didn't have any pain. I just it started with a, a cough. I guess the kidneys, you know, pushed up and was stopping me from from keeping food down. Little by little, it would get worse and worse to the point where. I was eating and throwing up within a few minutes. <coughs> it was the same with me. I, I didn't want to make it too long and I, want, I wanted to make it different. That's the only reason that I didn't get to all the pathology, how you call it, that was, that was my, my case since I was diagnosed. I diagnosed in 2010, but I never had a problem. He just studied it like something that my regular doctor, which God bless him, he's a good doctor. Even that I know, I know he got he got some kind of cancer also from a year ago. And he retired. He told me that then I guess I just think that it's a common common cold or something. Let let let's try some antibiotics. We we tried. It didn't work. He sent me to a urologist. I don't want to mention his name because he told me that uh, it's not the number of months but the weeks that I have to live. But it's a pretty respectable uh, doctor in Queens. Uh, so I'm seventy years old. I, I again I don't want to mention his name, it's none of my business about that. But uh, it just uh, it, 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 I caught it because I wasn't able to urinate. It was something like 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 really clot, something solid blood. And I said, What what what, what the hell is this? And then I, I I couldn't urinate. One, two, three days. After that, like I mentioned before, he do the, he did something and he said it an ultrasound that you have a mass in your kidney. And I, I immediately I went to the Sloan Kettle and MSK and uh, Dr. Corman was the, the surgeon that, that uh, got blessed me too. So it, it, it's also, that, that, that still surprises me that there's no way to catch this. At least from, from like a, not, not something, somebody that's a pro, you, you, you don't have a scan, you don't have like, even for the blood, the, the, the blood, the blood work, it doesn't come off always. Not always. As far as I know. So it, it's got to be a coincidence or something, which is sad. That, that's all I wanted to say. So, okay. oh, I'm sorry. Um, I have a question. Uh, what was the medication you say that now you are um, cancer free, so you don't have anything, gas, no nodules? What was the medication and the treatment that you followed? Dr. Dutcher could speak to that more. He got, he got high of citric too. One week, and low dose of the second week. And he had the immunotherapy. That's my wife. You, you don't want to ask the bill more. I think, personally speaking, um, when you first get diagnosed, is to go around and interview various oncologists and find the one that you're most comfortable with um, who agrees with your way of thinking because I I saw four and I got almost four different types of opinions and you have to go shopping and get what you feel is what you're thinking is the way to cure this or the way to cope with it and once you find that person that agrees with you as far as your way of going through treatment, that's the one that you stick with. And uh, and I have total confidence in Dr. Alter. I think he's fantastic. And um, I, I follow every bit of advice he gives me as far as how to treat both the cancer and to continue living as best as you possibly can. But not your football team. <laughs> <laughs> They're on your fantasy team. So. <laughs> so how how do you cope? How does everyone cope with this disease? How do your families cope? Well, personally speaking, um, I mean, you have good days and you have bad days. I mean, it's it's the fatigue is part of the medication, and you deal with it. Um, 
there are days when I come home from work and I have four or five things I want to do and I sit on the recliner and those four or five things don't get done because I just don't feel like getting up and doing them. But then there's other days that I feel fine and, and I can function and do the things I need to do around the house, uh, either to help my mother or, or to just do the basic, you know, home things that you need to do. Um, and um, I, I went out and played golf actually for the first time recently, which was refreshing uh, since I had my leg operated on. And uh, uh, you just try to, you know, you, you, I mean, it's, it's there, you know it's there, but you try to put it in the back, and as long as you're physically able to do stuff, you just go out and do it, and, and do the best you can. Live your life. For me, it works just one day at a time. Yep. Try to enjoy it every day. If there are some things, exactly, because the, the, the fatigue it, it, it comes. It's something that is it's inevitable, but, but uh, I do have a tendency of blaming it on, on my age, or the fact that I'm not young anymore, I'm not, not on, the, on the disease. But uh, there are like things I wish to do, and I can't, and I say, well, I'm not my planet anymore. I'm gonna walk my call it just for half an hour, not two hours, but uh, one day at a time. I don't know. At least for me, it works. Yeah. I think. I think early on, you kind of you kind of ask yourself, why does this happen to me? Uh, because I wasn't a drinker. I mean, I I, I I go out for a few drinks and stuff like that, but, but I wasn't out you know, drinking a lot of alcohol or anything like that. I wasn't a smoker. Um, I considered myself in fairly decent shape. I wasn't in great shape, but I was in, you know I was working out and, and taking care of myself for the most part. And then. The next day, it changes. It's like you know, I I, I have my own business in Princeton. Um, I worked that day, Friday. Uh, it was a slow day. I took a half a day, played nine holes of golf, went home, read the paper, watched a little TV. Everything was normal. Went to bed, had a great night's sleep, and the next morning, it was different. I just woke up and started peeing blood. And it's kind of like wow. It's like what happened? <laughs> it was like yesterday. It was it, everything was fine. So, and I'm sure a lot of people go through that same thing. I mean, I'm no different than probably anybody else. But uh, it's really, uh, it's an eye opener for sure. We kind of wound up being a little bit different in the way that we treated it, because it was something, okay, now we have a problem, right? Let's not worry about this, we got this problem. So we spent a lot of time trying to research what our options were and how to deal with it, where the right is trying to do that. So in some respects, the fact that it sort of swung our focus on to dealing with the, the disease and whatever problems that would come with that um, kept you from getting too worried. It sounds strange, but but okay, now mm -hmm. this is a problem to solve. I got to deal with this. So we were focused on that, and so um, and certainly have a much higher appreciation for the friend <coughs> that's your borrow already. Um, and in some respects, it's it's sort of different because now you have a situation where. Okay, you're, you're just kind of watching it, and you know that it's a possibility that it could come back any time, which kind of makes you appreciate that you have that much more. So um, the fact that we're sort of a partner team dealing with it all the time is hugely important, right? If I was doing it by myself, you know, we don't all hit the bottom at the same time, right? So we sort of manage to keep each other uh, afloat a little bit. Any other questions? Yeah. I, I had a question just <clears throat> about any lifestyle changes or in terms of your diet or exercise. I mean, I, I know you said that you were taking pretty good care of yourself before. Is there any advice um, that you might have, you know, as you're managing the disease, um, you know, for any, any kind of changes or things to watch out for? I, I'm always thinking of like, you know, should I be just buying all organic? You know, things that like there are things that I could be doing to um, enhance health and the immune system. If I can comment, a friend of mine, after he found out that I had this, asked me what I was eating, you know, what I was taking care of myself, and I said, I'm eating whatever the hell I want because it makes me feel good. <laughs> and so, I, you know, unless there's something that's indicated that there's something bad for you, I'm going to do whatever makes me feel good. I'm on the right side of the grass, and I'm pretty happy about that, so I'm going to do whatever I want. Yeah, no, no diet changes at all. If there's, if there's anything unusual, I'll, I'll actually check with Dr. Uh, Dr. Alter or, or Shauna 
and see if you know if they wouldn't recommend, especially being on a phase two trial. I don't want to screw that up by, by doing something that, that might affect that. But um, you know, no. I mean, just just eat what you would normally. I wouldn't I wouldn't change anything. Um, you know, if you enjoy something, eat it. You know, it's like <laughs> don't deny yourself that. I mean, you're, if you get this, you've already been through enough. Why deny yourself something you enjoy doing or eating? Uh, enjoy it. Anybody else? Well, I hope that you all have learned as much as I have. Sometimes I think when I come to these that, uh, you know, I've heard it all, and I go to a lot of these, and I go to the medical symposiums and, and whatever, but there is never a time when I don't learn from the doctors who are presenting, from the patients who are presenting, from the patients I talk to in, in the hallway. Um, it never Learning is a never-ending process, and particularly with kidney cancer. It's... Um, the Kidney Cancer Association has a, a booklet. You go on our website, you'll find it. Many of you have probably already read it at one point or another. I try to remind myself to read it every once in a while, and it's, we have kidney cancer. I want to emphasize the we right now, because in listening to all of you talk, I'm reminded that it's a team. It's, you're not just treating someone's cancer, you're treating the family's cancer. Um, and, it, and that just came out loud and clear with the patient panel, and I want to thank you. As I mentioned before, I myself had kidney cancer. I was diagnosed in 99, and my husband had kidney cancer. We met after uh, our initial kidney cancers. But in some respects, I'm lucky because I've been on both sides of the bed. I've been the patient and I've been the caregiver. And I want to say to all you caregivers up here, out there, I'd rather be in the bed. It's much easier to internalize your emotions when it's you. When it's someone you love and you feel helpless, that's the hardest thing. It, it, it really, really is hard. I know I'm not diminishing what patients go through. Um, you know, I don't wish this on anyone, but watching, working with my husband on this, I'd rather it was me in the bed and, and not him. That being said, I don't want to, uh, these stories have been so inspirational. I, I thank each and every one of you. As difficult as, some of, as it is for some of you to talk about your personal things, Whitey, um, you did a great job. All of you did a, a really, really good job. And it really brings home, um, really brings home that, that you can't give up. And there is hope. And, and uh, another, there are a whole bunch of things I want to say, lots of things floating around in my head. but. Um, one of the questions was about, you know, what are you eating? Should you change your diet, et cetera? I think as a, as a patient, a cancer patient, sometimes people approach you who've never had cancer and they say, well, you know, why did you get it? Obviously, we don't know why. And the thing to remember is it's not anything that you did that caused your kidney cancer. As Jan said, you know, it's, it's in your body, but it's not you. You didn't do anything. So you can't blame yourself, you can't blame pretty much anything else except maybe the environment uh, for triggering um, the, the start of, of the growth, if you will. Um, I guess, are there any other questions for our, our patient panel here? Uh, Paula? Um, not a question, just a, a, a comment. I would like to thank my fellow survivors for taking the time to share your stories with us. Um, I, as you know, volunteer for the association. I would encourage everyone in this room, both patients and caregivers, you know, to become actively involved and engaged with the association. And doctors. Oh, well, we're getting everybody there. Wait a minute. Um, you know, to become involved. We have a wonderful, you know, association going, and it's because of people like you, the doctors, the scientists, the researchers, the lab technicians, 
you know, everybody. And as Sarah said, it's a team effort. We all need to be in this and do this together. Quick story I want to share with you. I was a patient rep at the ASCO meeting last year. And I was on the shuttle bus. Oh, thank you. Uh, I was on the shuttle bus going from the hotel to the convention center, seated next to this guy. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. My badge identified me as a patient advocate and a survivor. So he's doing his business, I'm doing my business on the bus, and we get to the convention center, we're getting off, and he turned, he tapped me on the, sh on the arm, and he said, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. He said, it's because of people like you that we do what we do. And I was so touched by that. Oftentimes we just say, oh, it's a doctor's job, he's supposed to do that, or she's supposed to do that. No. They really put a lot of time and effort and energy into what they do because they care about us. The, now, the bottom line certainly is not dollars and cents. The bottom line is our care and our quality of life. Everyone in this room is a survivor. You're a survivor from the time you're diagnosed. When you're told you have cancer, I think it's just an automatic, you know, gesture that you, you go into fight mode. I remember Jan telling a story about one of her patients several years ago when he was diagnosed with kidney cancer. He heard that and he said, oh well, any day now, it's going to curl up and die. And to my knowledge, he's still with us. So it's just a, a natural thing. Your, your body just goes into fight mode. So I encourage all of you to continue fighting. You know, continue to be engaged with us and continue to be engaged with each other. That's very important. Nobody understands kidney ca cancer patients better than a fellow kidney cancer patient. Mary talks about her breast. Jack talks about his colon. Yeah, that's all fine, well and good. We have that overall sympathy for cancer. But when it comes to kidney cancer, we are the brother and sisterhood. And we are the glue that we keep each other together. And I would encourage you to please stay together, st you know, stay engaged. And certainly look forward to seeing you, you guys for many, many more years. Thank you, Paula. Not much more to say. On your schedule, um, it says that Dr. Wang is going to do the closing remarks, but pretty much Paul and I just did the closing remarks. He had to leave. Um, there are a couple of housekeeping things. There's a, uh, an, an evaluation form that will be at the back door. I want to encourage everyone to, to fill that out. And Dr. Molina wanted to talk about a support group. So we're, I'm actually going to be starting a kidney cancer support group in uh, collaboration with the Kidney Cancer Association, and our first meeting is going to take place in, on February 7th. Um, well, if you left your, uh, your email here, we can email you the information. Um, it'll be at Royal Cornell Medical College, my new institution now, and uh, the first speaker uh, is uh, Shane Robinson. She's actually a, a medical oncology um, a nutritionist that's going to come and talk about nutrition and kidney cancer. Uh, so I'll, I'll be leading these uh, groups every other month. Uh, the first one, again, is February 7th. It's at 10 a.m. at Wild Cornell, and we'll give you the information uh, via email. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Molina, and thank you to all of you, every doctor who is here, every patient who is here, every caregiver who is here. I'd like to thank NYU for hosting us. Uh, it's a great facility. It's fantastic. Clean up after yourselves as you're leaving. Um, and of course, thank you to the Kidney Cancer Association. Thank you all. Oh, and one more thing. As I heard one of the patients. Oops. One of the, one of the patient's wife said, eat the brownies first. <laughs>